My name is Monk Rowe, and I'm at Hamilton College for the Phileas Jazz Archive, and I'm really pleased to have Ada Rovati with me this afternoon. Welcome. Well, thank you. <laughs> thank you for having me. I'm going to ask you uh, a new question for today. So far today on this Tuesday, uh, what have you done musically that contributes to you making a living in music? Well, unfortunately, is uh, answering email. <laughs> That's the first things you do in the morning. Just uh, um, I'm, I'm, I just got back from Germany where I record uh, the basic track of my new album and uh, I have to add uh, strings, percussion and soloists. So this morning was the, the time to send some of the charts and update of what's uh, what's uh, going to happen. So um, that's the first thing. So, I mean, of course, you know, in the morning when I get up, I put some music on that always help a way to kind of start in a good mood the, the day. But then there is the kind of a hunted, hunting <laughs> task of answering email and business that is not, uh, I mean, it helps to kind of moving forward, but it's not as uh, uh, technical as uh, practicing. I haven't touched my horn yet, but I will. <laughs> Is the music that you tend to put on related to the music that you create, or do you find that something on the opposite end of the spectrum also works for you? Definitely on the uh, opposite side of a spectrum. Uh, somehow music, you know, I I grew up uh, uh, playing a classical music. I was a piano player trained. So, and uh, at the time I didn't like very much classical music. I was more into uh, English pop. Uh, but now I find myself that uh, I maybe even listen more classical music than jazz. Um, and somehow it treats some interesting how the brains work sometimes. So, you know, I listen to music like uh, traditional Irish music with the, I love Irish music. And somehow it treats something that is totally opposite and it just go in the jazz realm, just go figure how the brains uh, works with like uh, sounds, uh, sounds wave, uh, just a kind of a vitamins for the brain. Yeah. I found that I think my tastes uh, have sort of gone backwards in that I like music in both jazz and classical sort of where I know where I am in it. Yeah. If, if you know what I mean. Yeah. You just uh, kind of like you feel at home in a certain way. <laughs> yes. <laughs> but, you know, I just like, it depends of also the mood because, uh, you know, there are some times that, you know, you know, I can't, I cannot listen Coltrane because it just uh, is like uh, taking over caffeinated myself. You know, I wouldn't be able to relax on a Coltrane uh, CDs because my mind goes on a kind of not working, but it's just like, you know, I hear those things. I analyze, I just discover, oh, I didn't notice that he was doing that. So to me, it's just like, it's not a way to relax. So sometimes I even if I put like a Tibetan uh, bells, is more relaxing because you don't have to analyze anything. You just the sound spin one note for th three minutes and that's it, you know? <laughs> well, were your parents, um, con did they contribute to your musical career? Did they want you or force you to take piano lessons? Well, my grandmother was a piano teacher. So I think all the, my brother and my cousin, we all went through uh, her teaching. The only one who stuck with it was me. <laughs> so that's uh, that's how it worked. But I I have a, a in a certain way family uh, like a musical family. My my dad plays some piano because her mother played piano. Uh, my my mother from her, her family side. My great grandfather was a director of orchestra. So and my mom played a little guitar, but. Um, I was lucky that I was surrounded by music. Unfortunately, not really jazz because that was not, uh, you know, just was not part of the way I grew up. I mean, the only jazz recording I had, it was uh, being Crosby singing Christmas tunes. So <laughs> that's as far as jazz as I was exposed as a child. But uh, well, <laughs> I kind of catch up. <laughs> you know, you said before we were recording that you were really into uh, holiday lights and perhaps that's it. 
perhaps that planted yeah that. yeah i know it just make me happy I, I remember as a kid i used to stare at like two inches the christmas tree lights of changing color and i could say i'm not kidding i could stay one hour i was like uh, there was something magical about it you know and so now that they are cheap and they are lead and they don't consume very much i kind of plaster my practice room you know <laughs> <laughs> it's like people that come here it's like wow it's always christmas here <laughs> yeah <laughs> did your parents understand when you embraced jazz as a, uh i'll use the word passion was it a passion for you in high school well we don't have a, um you know in italy everybody kind of me uh, thinking that you know is a country of a bel canto the music and the conservatory the opera so it has to be music at school and matter of fact it's absolutely not like that uh, in an elementary school, we have a recorder and choir. In middle school, we have history of music, but not actual, you know, practice the instruments or anything. In high school, we don't have music. So there's absolutely no music at school. And unless you have parents that are, you know, willing to enroll you in some extra curriculum outside of a school um, music uh, course, you are not... Uh, um, exposed to music. I was lucky that my grandmother played piano. And, uh, you know, and so somehow I start through piano, I started kind of experiment. I like uh, pop. And then, you know, my brother started to play guitar, he put the band together and uh, it was a blues band. And he convinced me that if I, he won a horn section, he convinced me that if I was, uh, if I play saxophone, I would be popular with boys. So <laughs> that's the only reason I went into music. Was he right? <laughs> Of course, I found a husband. <laughs> Highly suggest that for any single out there to pick up an instrument. Well, there you go. <laughs> because, you know, because later I was going to ask you about advice to uh, up and coming musician so you can put that on, on the yeah list, there you have but you know my parents uh, you know they uh, I have an unusual set of parents uh, um you know uh, they travel all over the world not the classical Italian parents if somebody can think my mother was a you know national softball team my father was a professional hunter in Africa and travel all over the world so the one things they they taught me is just like uh, you have wings use it so the freedom and uh, knowing people, knowing uh, um, culture is just uh, enlarge your mind and grows your mind and grows your heart. So that was the best uh, uh, supporting environment I ever had. So, and I'm lucky for that. Yeah, nice. Can you recall what your, um, I assume you had to do an audition of some sort to get the Berkeley scholarship and do you remember what tunes you played? Oh, well, I, you know, unfortunately, I started really late play saxophone because I was uh, at the end of high school. Um, and uh, I um, I started as a baritone player because I thought that maybe the chance to get a scholarship were higher and rightfully so. And I followed the two, two weeks uh, course at the, uh, Berkeley still has a, a two weeks course at the uh, Umbria Jazz, the festival in Italy. And that's how I, I followed the two courses. And at the end, I got a scholarship. And I think so, is it was a mix. I was a really a beginning, but thanks God, they found some kind of, uh, I guess, uh, um, talent hidden somewhere because I, I barely could play and read. Uh, I was like kind of a really kind of a beginner. I could hear a lot of stuff and I had the facility with the technique, I guess, because coming from classical music and play piano. So I could hear stuff. I had a good ear, but you know, my, I was really a beginner, but they, 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 they bet on me and I think I did. Okay. okay. I think <laughs> it was a good bet. <laughs> yeah. Were you, so. <laughs> uh, was there a bit of, of academic and culture shock when you went to Boston and, and Berkeley? Yes, but I was craving for that. I was, you know, I, I'm coming from a small town in the north of Italy. And, uh, you know, when I start really playing and I start kind of really kind of, you know, I love the, the environment, the idea, why I want to, I have the million ideas. 
um, it was hard to find somebody who was committed as I was to music. You know, the people that want to play or want to play jazz was still even smaller. I was lucky there was a little big band, but, you know, there were all people that had another job and, you know, I want to practice, uh, you know, play new things every day, meet. And, you know, it was lucky if you find somebody once every 10 days. So uh, going in an environment where everybody is uh, so driven like uh, I was, uh, it was uh, exciting, refreshing, and a little, you know, overwhelming also because, uh, you know, the moment I step into Berkeley, I realize how how poorly musician I was. You know, uh, I was just a man. You know, there were especially in the summer there was uh, kids. They were high school kids. They were fourteen, fifteen, and they have their everything together they had the tone the timing the um, knowledge and I was you know much older than them I was already 19 20 because you know that's when I finished high school I went uh, to Berkeley and I didn't have any of those things so unfortunately is one thing that I still pay the uh, the the toll I think uh, that I I didn't have that uh, you know that background of uh, having a school uh, somebody who teach me when I was younger and I always say when I do master's class at schools that you like you don't realize how lucky you are you know uh, in, a, in elementary school you had the chance to pick up an instrument I saw the first saxophone when I was 16 or 17 you know so you just that uh, there and the way you learn at when you're younger is much different than when you're already grown up you know you just you absorb in a different way and I'm, you know and I still feel that you know some basic of my musical puzzle are still missing some of the basics because I was already kind of rushing into working I was already kind of an adult I, so you know you don't spend you don't have the the freedom of like oh you know I can practice all day long somebody's gonna pay my bills you know <laughs> when I start to kind of you know <laughs> Yeah. Well, it's interesting because um, Randy explained a, a bit um, in our interview about the way both of you work and some of the technology. But when you said occasionally you run into things that you still are missing in your music education, can you be specific about that? Just, I, I swear, it's like simple stuff, you know. I still feel that sometimes my time is wiggly-woggly. And uh, it's just like uh, sometimes my idea, they don't, you know, there are simple things that, you know, probably for any beginner or musician will be the first step that you do it. And I uh, skip some of the step, maybe st uh, steps because maybe I was, uh, I technically was a little advanced, so I was more going for the idea. And then I realized that, uh, yeah, but I slop it up all the way to the idea. So, you know, I need to slow down uh, you know, the, the metronome, hello, uh, <laughs> is there to be used, uh, not as a centerpiece of a table. <laughs> so a lot of things, uh, you know, but also, you know, clearly more you, you study, more you play, more you advance, uh, more you go looking for the, the, you know, that the little problem. And that's where, you know, the last few years has been, you know, just going, find what's not working you know because uh, you know i can enjoy my i can just uh, you know flatter myself how how can i sound good on that but that's not the point you know you know in this room that's i want to see where i suck sorry my french mm -hmm. <laughs> you know that's where i wanted to to see where i messed up the things and where i need to be really honest with myself where you know where i do the mistake and i need to take care of here so, and, you know, that's, you know, is it hard to kind of look at yourself? It's like, you know, and see your flaw and acknowledge them and be willing to change them. You've got an uh, impressive, I guess we call it a discography so far, not with your own, your own material and then playing on other people's recordings. Do you have a sense of why people call you to play on their recordings? Well, you know, I, you know, ooh, that's a good one. Well, you know, with Randy, yes, is my husband and I'm the wife, but clearly, you know, if I couldn't, you know, a lot of people assume that, oh, if she's in the Brecker Brothers, all plays with him. Yes and no. Yes, I'm the wife, but clearly if I couldn't play, I wouldn't be there. And uh, I think he likes the idea that I have my own sounds. And, uh, you know, of course, I would love to sound like Mike, but nobody's going to sound like Mike. And 
Um, and I don't, I don't, I keep trying to practice and be as good as him, but I wanted to keep my own identity. So he always say that I have a pretty strong uh, sounds and identity in, and uh, I wanted to keep working on that. Mm -hmm. I think I have, uh, uh, you know, a good attitude towards music. I take everybody, every music seriously. So any kind of a job that is asked, you know, that I've been asked, I always spend time in order to understand what they want and try to do the best I can. So I'm uh, professional and I think I have something to say, you know, uh, I hope so. And I, you know, hope. <laughs> I like that you have, you have something to say. The um, I know that some of the older generation of musicians they used to say, well, tell a story when you're yeah. improvising. Well, I think it's, a, it's the same in the moment we are talking to me and you right now is an exchange of uh, question and uh, comments and a little comedy, a little, you know, and the same should be on a bandstand. It's just an interaction. And you want to be sure that not only the musician get the, uh, the interaction, but also the audience. Uh, I was actually talking today, I was in a car with Randy and saying that, you know, um, sometimes uh, some of the jazz that I hear, it, it sounds like a private conversation between a, a elite of musician. And, uh, you know, there, you cannot remember any melody or any beat you just don't. I mean, I do appreciate that, that kind of intellectual music because it's really kind of like intellectual and you can, but you know, what about the famous music is entertainment? You know, you have also the audience be part. If, if it's just a private talk between just a lead of a musician, that's that's that, you know? You know, so I like to hear the melody. I like that people can just move their head. They just kind of, you see that they have a feedback. That's how I get excited and I, you know, play better. You know, if it's just between me and my music and a couple of my friends, we can just stay in the basement. Uh, we'll do the same. Right. I, <laughs> I liked watching, there's a number of um, videos on YouTube of you in the at Brecker Brothers. And there's one moment where you're, you're taking sort of an extended solo. And I mean, this is not a big deal. It's bandstand etiquette, but you you turn and you give the band a cue. Yeah. Like, okay. <laughs> I'm uh, let's move, you know, like I'm, yeah, I'm that's sort of done. <laughs> and then the, the band moves on. I, I just love that stuff. And I, yeah, I think people who are in the audience who are really into it, they, they probably see that. Yeah, I think so. Plus I'm Italian. I'm always moving my hands. <laughs> you know, they joke uh, how you yes. shut up in Italian, you tie their hands behind their back. <laughs> so I'm doing very good on a stage. <laughs> well, you yeah, have a, how did you develop um, the altissimo? Well, that's one thing that also I'm still practicing because uh, it's not where it should be or what I would like to be. Okay. Uh, but um, yeah, I'm doing like overtones, uh, doing exercise. But uh, sometimes, you know, when I get too nervous, I tend always to bite a lot of the mouthpiece uh, and that doesn't help uh, the, the tone and the uh, altissimo register. So that's one thing I'm working, trying to not put so much pressure. And it's a daily thing. Sometimes when I'm more relaxed, I can go easy uh, on an altissimo and, you know, be more technical. If I'm nervous, forget about it. Sometimes I aim for a note and something else comes out. But have you ever experienced the fact that you go for some of those notes in the practice room and you can't get them, but when you're surrounded by friendly chords that they seem to come out? Yeah. I'm not sure what that's about. It's like... Uh, it, it, well, you know, is this, uh, I more I'm getting older, more I realize that uh, has to do a lot with the... Uh, confidence there is something that if you feel at ease with the musician you don't feel to prove yourself if you just say i'm here to do what i can do and i do the best and i'll try to have fun sometimes everything works better if you just start to kind of double guessing yourself wondering what people might think uh, getting nerves uh, that's a that's a recipe for disaster at least for me <laughs> You know, yeah, sometimes, you know, I, I finish the gig, one of those stressful gigs that you just like, you feel that you have like, you know, you're trying to 
or impress or at least you know i don't know to get all into the what they're thinking what what if what and uh, i always think oh my god thanks god i'm not a surgeon i would have killed somebody tonight (laughs) (laughs) so at least i can (laughs) relax on that no do you find it uh, i won't say easier how is it different if you're soloing over a vamp on one chord rather than playing changes like on a hard bop tune or something is your thought process different um well you know it's just with one chord uh, uh, of course depends of the, also the band you're playing with uh, is just like uh, is a black uh, is a you know white canvas uh, that you can just go in the direction you want so it's one chord sir, and then you just like play out in and out and just kind of rhythmically you you know instead if you know there is a, a specific form and uh, uh you know with a specific rhythm of the, the change the chords change clearly you know you have uh, some flexibility of reharmonization and playing in and out but you still have to kind of follow the chords and the form so it's a different kind of approach but um, but it's just like you know sometimes uh, you know one one exercise I like to do just to open my ears. You know a lot of people say when you play out, what do you think? It's just like I think it uh, comes down to confidence and just uh, bend the boundaries that we have in our inner ears. Uh, you know if you're playing in C and sometimes I put one of those Abersol like you know C seven. And the band playing C seven, and I keep playing B seven or C sharp seven or F sharp seven. That is totally out, you know, clashing. But if you keep playing against those chords, you're gonna realize that your brain, little by little, isn't up, doesn't hear that much that dissonance. And matter of fact, when you go back in C. It sounds that like you're messing it up. It's, your brain is kind of like suddenly is like, what are you playing? And I'm playing C over C, you know. But uh, it just that tells you that it's all here, um, the dissonance. And it's, it's fun to just play in the totally dissonant and go in and out of a chords. It's just a way also to pulling the audience. It's like, look at me now. Look at look what I do. And they kind of don't get it, but then they feel relaxed when you go back in the key. So it's just a way also teasing your ears, the musician, the, it's just a game, you know? Oh, that, that's wonderful. I No one ever said that exactly like that. So are there- It's a way wrong... of teasing your senses. Let's uh-huh. put it like that. Okay. So what constitutes a wrong note in, in improvisation? What prompt you? Um, what do you, can you play a wrong note when you're improvising? No, you know, if you mean it, yeah, well, you know, if you start to think it, that is not a wrong note, you know, I mean, of course, you know, land is some bad and nobody kind of follow you, but, you know, we played the weekend with, uh, um, was a Dickie Koski on piano and Alex Claffey on bass and Steve Johnson drums and, and Randy. And one of the Randy's tune uh, it started with an E flat major. So, you know, pl- I played the solo and then I finish and I purposely, I ended on an E natural and it was E flat major. Beautiful. Kikowski put out the funkiest chord ever and it sound perfect. So, you know, and I on purpose, I, I kind of like uh, wanted to land it on something out. And the band didn't blink. It just went for it and it sounds the most amazing. And then Kikowski was play after me and he started with the E nature over E flat and he kept going. And it was magic. You know, when you when you have a band like that, you are allowed to kind of explore and they kind of hold you like that. And even your mistake when you was like, oh, totally mistake. They put something behind you that does they make a sense that you are not you are not mistaken. You know what I mean? That's true. You know, uh, there was a critic years ago, Whitney Bellier, who said he called jazz the sound of surprise. Yeah, so, it is. Yeah. You know. Let me ask you about your composing. Um, there's two tunes that I, I heard, and I think they're, well, I know they're a number of years apart as far as your recordings. 
one was airdrop <laughs> and the other one was i lost my wisdom <laughs> and they both have a if if my memory serves me they they both have a thing where you start out in one tempo and feel yeah before long you go somewhere else yeah that's uh, things i do in all my tunes there is always a little uh little things of surprise a little things that you know that when you expect something happen or it's not happening or when you don't expect you know you expect just to smooth the sailing for the rest of the tune something else happened to rock you <laughs> and i think the musician at this point the musician i'm working with they know they when i bring new tunes they're like oh here we are what she's doing you know and uh, i just like i don't know maybe i have a little um attention disorder so you know i like uh, um i i don't want to get bored so that's why i kind of always throw a twist in my tunes it's just kind of like oop, you know and i i like it to see the the reaction of the musician you know because uh one i remember one drummer told me it's like as soon as you get into the groove and you're thinking i got it you throw something that i need to just keep an eye on my chart <laughs> You know, I don't want to sound like, you know, just do like a cycle that go from one thing to the other. I like to, sometimes I write tunes that uh, they sound very organic. And then when you analyze uh, the charts, you're like, oh, I didn't realize you moved from seven, eight to da, 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 da. But your ears doesn't feel it as a, as a, just a change, a big change or a change of tempo or something like that. Only when you see the charts, and that's also <laughs> sometimes uh, things that, you know, they, they almost associate it not with smooth jazz because I wouldn't call smooth jazz my tunes, but they say, oh, you know, I, I have it, you know, I got it down. And then when they see the music, it's like, I, I guess I need to give an extra look to the chart. Are, you, are, your, they chart, sound, are, are your charts complicated? Would you call them complicated? Yes, they are. Okay. They don't sound complicated, but they are. <laughs> And I tend, especially in the last couple recording, I start to become very, I'm a little um, control freak. <laughs> let's see, let's say like that. I like to write specific things, bass line, voicing, um, specific rhythm and bass line, specific bass line through the melody. On the solo, do whatever you want. I mean, I leave you the freedom of uh, going around, but on the heads, I want specific things and I have a clear mind. You know, I just saw, you know, the recording we did in Germany, you know, there were a couple of places that the band was like, I don't know, did, did you write this one? I was like, no, I want exactly like that. I don't know if it's work, it's not the right key for the bass. No, I wanted the right, play the way it's written. And then they were like, ha, huh, actually it does work. I was like, yeah, I, I hear it. You know, I knew what I wanted. So I was excited that I stick to my gun. <laughs> Do you write at the computer? Yes, uh, I I mean uh, mostly I play I play piano. And then if I have some good idea, I write notes on a on a paper, and then I may I play on a on a keyboard just to remember better the feelings. Or, okay. uh, but uh, that's one good great things that I had a background in piano because I write everything on a piano, and somehow I always hit the perfect range for B flat instruments. So <laughs> it's interesting how it works. If you got a phone call from some group uh i know you've done commissions i i saw a thing about a commission you and randy did and um they ask you to write something and they don't give you any guidelines mm -hmm. or instrumentation is there something you do to try to inspire something to get started well, the, the tune should give me already some input, but usually I, I ask, uh, you know, if they want a full horn section, just the horn, you know, just the so, just the some, how many horns, just to have an idea the sounds they want. And and I ask, uh, you know, do you, do you, you know, hear kind of like, uh, you know, Tower of Power or just kind of more kind of like a, a traditional writing or, you know, can I, uh, so I, just to have an idea what they want, but it happened sometimes that I wrote something that I thought it was good and they, they didn't went for it. You know, it's normal, you know, uh, they, they say, well, it's uh, just, uh, you know, I was thinking of a little more traditional. Okay. You know, sometimes also people that commission, they don't have a clear idea. 
so they they kind of you know you write something and then you realize that they couldn't word out what they want but then you write and they and they say that's not what i want okay so you so you know it's like okay i need to go to the other direction and it happened or sometimes happened that you know they 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 don't tell you anything and they hear it's like i would never thought to, to thinking about some horn section or some arrangement like that but i love it <laughs> so <laughs> go figure I would imagine you know? sometimes you'd have something that's already partly written and you can go, ah, I might be able to use this thing that's been floating around. Is, is that a Well, it, that's one I do it for my own tunes because I have uh, like uh, bars here. I have like books and books of little ideas in a computer filled with like a logic file with the three million tunes ideas. But for other people, usually I just go fresh. I enter in the tune is a new thing. So what I hear and, uh, you know, there are so clearly some gimmick that uh, I notice that I use harmonically wise or rhythmically that I, I notice like I always do some of these, you know, but maybe it's my my trademark. Who knows? Yeah, that's <laughs> that style right there. Yeah. <laughs> Who knows? Well, I just noticed I, I but. I saw your people that you've played with. I think you and I have something in common that we both played <laughs> behind Aretha Franklin. Uh-huh. That was the, the I, I still think is one of the best uh, day of my life. Because uh, when I when I started to play saxophone, the first gig I had was I, I played the horn for one month. And we play with this little local band. Uh, cannot tell you the level we were. And one girl wanted to sing uh, "Respect." Cannot tell you how it came out, but you know. And uh, who knew that the little girl playing in that funky band back in Italy, in the middle of nowhere, years later, will be at the Kennedy Center behind the real deal. <laughs> that was a one day that I say, "Well, Ada, you didn't mess up too much in your life." Was that at least one. Was that the event that honored Carol King? No, you um a... no, that was a um I think it was organized for the Monk Institute. Uh was something like that. And uh, um and we were asked, uh, you know, I was one of the guests and it's supposed to play the day after the, the we arrived the early the day before to do rehearsal and like out of nowhere they ask um would you be willing to be in the horn section with uh, Rita Franklin and I was like uh yes <laughs> look at me <laughs> I was thrilled you know in it just I mean that's yeah. massive it, you know it's just funny because uh, the same night we had the perform also with um, Herbie Hancock and a bunch of other superstar but Aretha <laughs> you know that's another thing. And I remember before going on stage, I was really next to her. And it was just like, you know, this woman, what, you know, the amount of talent, uh, the the goosebump this woman gave me throughout my life. It was just like, I was like, thank you. <laughs> I had a hard time. She played here at our college and I, I was in the sex section and I had a hard time not watch. I, I couldn't watch her because we were yeah you have to look the music yeah we were sort of sight reading you know and like you that's say, the oh. same you know <laughs> you know when they brought the chart they they just say okay today she doesn't want to do in this key so you know they hey, da, da, you have to transpose da, 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 da. so we were sight reading and transposing at the same time so it was kind of like oh look yeah okay we made it through so i, I was so nervous and looking at the charts that uh, you know you can see this, i have some picture of me with this kind of scare look like <laughs> of pure <laughs> panic mode <laughs> but i still have the picture with her so that's what's matter <laughs> wonderful you know in a in a perfect world the idea of the woman jazz musician wouldn't be an issue like you're a jazz musician yeah. but i guess we're not at that point yet have you experienced um, not getting work that you thought you would have, how do I phrase this? Do you think you've lost work because you're a woman jazz musician? Well, um, I, I, <laughs> I have a mixed feeling about uh, all these uh, movement about, uh, 
you know, women, because yes, we have been in discrimination for a long time. Um, but, oh, okay, let's start with the, you know, uh, the fact, yes, we are still seen as a kind of like a, a uh, you know, the beard woman, a circus uh, little gimmick. So, you know, and uh, so festivals say, hey, we already have a female saxophone player, so we cannot hire you. It's like, yeah, but you have 15 male saxophone player. You don't. So sometimes we are still seen as uh, like something, you know, like a token. Uh, a festival, they need to have a certain amount of women. So let's get the one saxophone play, one trap. So we are not still kind of just, uh, yeah, the other female saxophone player, she's doing that and I'm doing something else. So even if we're doing the same things, we are two different entities playing our own things. Nobody would have thought about saying, it's like, oh, we have Stan Getz and uh, da, 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 on a, you know. Uh, but uh, we still pay that. Um, the same for magazine, the same for review, the same for a lot of things. Of course, some counterparts saying, yeah, but, you know, a lot of times they, you know, they in uh, private events, they want a girl playing saxophone because it's cool. Yeah, but, you know, it's just like it's minimal. You know, you still need to be able to perform, you know. Um, so, you know, and all the other things, you know, it's like, on the other side, you know, uh, in just to, to kind of like, uh, I don't know how to to straight out the way I'm thinking, you know, <laughs> um, I found that, you know, sometimes, uh, you know, uh, there is a little too much fear of saying anything these days about women. I did, a, <laughs> I did, a, a, I grew up with a three uh, one brother and two cousin. So I was a kind of, I would wrestle them and I never thought a difference between, you know, uh, the gender, you know. And, uh, you know, he ha when, you know, especially in the last couple of years, I remember I did a big band and uh, gig and the band leader told the main musician how to dress. And then it was me and another female and they say, I would never dare to tell you what to wear. And I thought it was just like, Jesus, are we like that? That we are afraid to even talk about it or just like everybody's so now like, you know, afraid to say half things, you know, nobody can do a compliment to a woman out of afraid that you're going to be sue or stuff like that. And I found this is a little too far, you know. So I remember that I sent back to everyone. I'm, I'm twisted, sorry, but I sent to everyone in a big band a big a picture of Tassel, and I say, you know, Tassel, 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 okay. <laughs> and I say, you know, I was thinking to wear this. It's okay, you know. Just kind of like, okay, loosen up, you know. <laughs> It's okay, you know, just maybe it's my Italian way. I'm a little right on your face about things, you know, and I'm pro women, pro Me Too movement. But, you know, let's also not forget that the cameratism of a big band of playing together of just do the funny comment. Don't be afraid. If somebody say, oh, you cut your hair, you look great. Thank you, you know, or you wearing that one, you look great on the dress. Thank you, you know, just let's not bring it right away. You know, I've done scenario that, you know, the men, they're looking at their shoes now, you know, they don't even want to interact out of fear of being out of the line. It's like, oh, you know, yes, you know, we have a long way to go. There is a lot of messed up things, but, you know, um, I want to play music. I don't want to, you know... Um, just be bombarded of not not the rest of the band talking to me out of fear that you know they are not politically correct. Wow, that's a that's my other side, you know. <laughs> so probably I'm gonna get trashed by a lot of women I, female, I, but I, I you know that's it... well said. You know, is it just a both way? I I you know if I don't get respect by a man, I know how to put them on their place. You know, and. Um, it happened that I lost some gigs because I was a female and I was not. Uh, but I also say that, you know, I lost also, uh, you know, the hardest time I had, unfortunately, is with women, other women musicians. I noticed that, you know, um, I have great female musician that I'm a friend with and we really think uh, alike and we are really kind of mellow. We do our job. We 
And but you know, a lot of hard time I had on a band stand. I had I would say more hard time with women than with the men, believe it or not. And yes, unfortunately, because I think uh, you know, um uh, helping each other would make a big difference. Yeah, you know. Thank you for that. Do you know uh, Rosano Sportiello? Yes, uh, actually, we are coming from almost the same area. We are we grew up uh, ten minutes apart. Oh my! You God. know, and wow. we met, knew them from from Italy. So it's well, great. It's he great. great. He's played up here uh, numerous times, and I wanted to read and um, something he said, and it's just an excerpt. But he he stated this. He was talking about. Uh, his formative years in Milan and a uh, fellow musicians, he, he said, we felt that the way some American musicians played jazz was really special, that that was the right way. So every time we heard one of these musicians playing, we heard that there was something superior. So what happened was that when we would play gigs with my Milanese colleagues and one of us would play very well, the most beautiful comment compliment that we could tell each other was tonight you sounded like an American yeah that was like that yeah and uh, well and you know as a female going back to the previous they would say you sound like a man <laughs> so <laughs> that was another compliment I would get in Italy you sound like a man and you sound like an American <laughs> you know <laughs> so <laughs> The first one didn't really never sit well with me, I have to say, you know, I see. Uh, but um, but I yeah, I we always look up to, you know, uh, jazz is a music that was was born here. So it, we found, you know, that American could have an authenticity and we 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 just kind of like try to copy. But I think this day at this point is a global music, you know, because um, if you close your eyes, you wouldn't think it is like some musician from New Orleans and maybe it's a little a young girl from Taiwan, you know. And, uh, you know, sometimes you just don't, you know, we arrive at the level that, um, you know, there are great musicians everywhere. And you, if it was a blindfold test, a lot of people wouldn't know who is, is a, uh, their ethnicity, where they're from, and their gender. You know, it's, it's, it's interesting and a bit ironic that jazz was thought of as an art form first in Europe, not here. Um, people, yeah, did that's a scholarly you know, that's, writing about it and all that kind of thing. Yeah, it was more appreciated. Um, I think it has to do also with the, you know, racism here in this country and in in uh, Europe, you know, just the, the way I also, I remember I grew up, there was always a kind of interested about, you know, when, uh, you know, musician would come uh, and tour in, in Italy, it was like, you know, the black musician, it was kind of cool. There was like, you know, there was not the, there was not the, uh, he added something even more exotic and more interesting, you know. Uh, so uh, I think that they didn't have to deal with the racism that it was here, you know. Yeah. And uh, and it just is a really as an art form, <laughs> you know. I think that that's when Europe got got it right right away. It was an art form. Um, here it took a little longer to be fully appreciated. Yes, but at the same time, as you mentioned earlier, it behooves it to have an entertainment aspect to it also. Mm -hmm. uh, otherwise, you know, sometimes you hear there's a phrase that has gone around like jazz is America's classical music. And some people like, no, we don't need it to be America's classical music. Just like, yeah, just let it be jazz. Yeah, no, that's that's true. I mean, also because there is a cl American classical music. They there are two different things. There are plenty of uh, classical. Yeah. I mean, I do understand like what they try to mean it, like in uh, saying that is just like that's the root word. We in Europe is classical music here. That's their the American classical music. But no, <laughs> it's let it be jazz. <laughs> so it seems that um, you and Randy have found a way, and I suppose this. Maybe it's just news to me that there is a technology now that you can 
exchange with people with sound files and okay this song needs a, a solo so they send you can you explain this process to me yes we you know get contact uh, to i would say or put a solo or a horn arrangement or anything and so they just send uh, sometimes just an mp3 if he's already mixed and he's a good mixer sometimes we tend to ask for uh, a different wave file so I, we can do our own mix it to you know hear better the drums or whatever um and we just kind of you know they ch send the charts i map out the chart and uh, record it sometimes they send already the pro tools file so it's easy maybe to upload it sometimes just the mp3 or the wave file and i'm the technician in the in the household so i set up all the session for him uh and uh, you know then take a few few takes uh, uh you know clean it up uh, if you do a horn section he lay down all his parts and you know clean it up uh, and then i add my own parts and align with him just to be sure it's nice and tight and uh that's it you know is a kind of a tailoring kind of job you know catering and sometimes uh, yeah you you send a couple you know two or three solo just to be sure that uh, to just you know, uh, you know, and so they, they, um, whoever produced the track, you know, hopefully one of the track will envision what they were looking for. You know, say it happens sometimes they cut themselves the track and use half of one or half the other. But usually, you know, we send something that is already fluent and is has a kind of a nice, uh, um, you know, little speech, a little talk, a little story, you know. Because sometimes, uh, you know, it happened that, you know, we hear people that they cut themselves and it was like, oh, that was not good cut. You know, he, you know, as a musician, you know where you're going and was, you know, we recognize our little story. And then if somebody cut it and put half and half, you say, that's not where I was going for. So it's interesting how we kind of know. <laughs> yeah, we we had said that earlier that we we can do this, but should we? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, uh, you can pass on this question if you'd like, but it, it's not a music question. But I'm curious when people like yourself um, relocate to the United States and observe our political and social issues. Mm -hmm. What do you think about it? Oh, yeah. <laughs> that's an answer right there. Uh, well, you know, especially from Italy, where he's well known to have a messed up uh, political situation. Nothing stand more than a couple months. Uh, we had uh, from Berlusconi to a porno star in a uh, um, in the political uh, uh, world. I don't know if I remember a few years ago. Uh, so we had like a, really like a, a, a lot of buffoon and uh, <laughs> and circus character mm. coming here. And if uh, I, I'm sh shocked, <laughs> well, I was shocked to see what was happening here politically. That tells you a lot, you know. I think that all the world was uh, was pretty shocked to see. I mean, I'm pretty open. I about my political view i'm i'm definitely not a trumpist let's put it like that mm -hmm. and uh um i was uh, i was totally shocked that the country like uh, united states you see we i grew up and i know that you know all my fellow european or all over the world we, we always grew up looking at united states like uh, the the best of the best. They have the best music, the best uh, uh, movies, uh, the best. Uh, everything was just like portrayed. We grew up looking at the, uh, you know, the mo American movies gave us an idea of uh, the American lifestyle. So we always look up to. It. And then coming here and see all these, uh, uh, a, a kind of like a different side that I guess was always hidden under the rock, but then suddenly came out. With the political, you know, the, you know, we didn't, you know, growing up, there was never, uh, you know, showing about racism in a certain way. You saw it as something maybe in the past, maybe like, but not something that when I moved here, I was shocked about, you know, the poverty, the, the, you know, the, all the problem of uh, 
beautiful country because uh, I'm going to be always thankful about this country who welcomed me. And, uh, you know, I had a lot of opportunity, but, you know, there was a lot of things that unfortunately just in the last few years, uh, they really came out out of under the rock, really a lot of hatred, hatredism, you know, um, so it's kind of sad and hopefully, you know, will be more and more recognized and put under the lights and just, uh, you know, do something about it. You know, I think, yes, a lot of was done from the last 100 years, but there is still a lot to go, you know. And uh, the way I, when I was raised in Italy, we didn't have a vision of America like that, definitely. Well, we probably have uh, an incorrect vision of Italy because we see in ads and and tours, you know, take a tour of it, of the of the best parts of Italy. So we, if we were to relocate up to somewhere in Italy, we probably yeah, you know, every country see the you know the the downside. Of course, we want to portray the best of us. You know, it's like when you go on a date app, you want to put your best picture and your best uh, characteristic. <laughs> you know, so I think every <laughs> every uh, country. I mean, we have right now we don't have we have a very um, bad um, uh, economical situation, kind of similar to what it was here a few years. Uh, couple of years ago with the Republican, with not Republican, I would say with Trump, you know. Uh, but um, so right now, you know, we have a lot of poverty and we unfortunately we have also a lot of racism now that one thing is that it was pretty new to Italy because I, when I grew up with, you know, okay, we didn't have so much of a multicultural um, and, you know, life, but, but, Every time I go back, is a lot of things change it and didn't change for the best, unfortunately. So, well, I'll lighten up a little bit. Um, I don't usually ask people about their their gear, but um, I had a thing this morning. I had to play tenor, and I re reminded myself what a lousy horn I have. <laughs> <laughs> can you no. can you tell me what what sax and mouthpiece you use? Yes, on uh, on the tenor, I have a P. Moriat. I'm endorsed by the company, and I I met him probably 15 years ago uh, at one of the Gen conference, and I tried them, and I I really really dig them right away. And uh, I have an Ice Mark Six also, but um, how I I is a beautiful one. Somebody bought it, used it for a month, put it away, and sold it to me 50 years later, something like that, or 40 years later. But as I uh, always say, is a flarp, <laughs> is a flarp, is a flat and sharp. <laughs> so, you know, on the palm key, you know, you have to do so much movement from one note to the other. And uh, it's just quite never there, you know, great sound, but man, how much work, you know. Mm -hmm. And it's a lot of times I don't, you know, you don't want to do a gig wondering how you're going to land and moving so much. So that's, uh, and also the traveling, I was, uh, I did a trip that, you know, they smashed my case. So after that one, you know, I was approached around the same times by P. Moriat and I thought it were great. And uh, uh, so I start to kind of play them and tell you the truth. I really never, you know, I once in a while pull out my Mark VI just, just for the fun of it, but I always play P. Moriat. Yes. And the mouthpiece, I, I'm playing a Rafael Navarro mouthpiece. And uh, I've been playing for five years. I really, really enjoyed them. And on the soprano, I have a Kyle Worth uh, that was given to me by Michael. Uh, years ago, I, I had a, I still have three herniated discs in my neck because of playing saxophone. So for a while, I couldn't, uh, I couldn't play the tenor. I couldn't put any weight. So, and I didn't have a soprano. So, he, you know, he had probably a stack of like hundreds of saxophone and he just uh gave me a this uh, beautiful calworth uh, and um and a mouthpiece is a prototype i think a, 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 a louis uh what's the name uh, louis um they are belgium louis i don't remember the name it has a metal uh but you know i keep changing i play also selmer sometimes uh, mouthpiece and uh, um you know, so far I'm happy, you know, it's, but it's always, you know, some some gigs you just kind of like, oh, I'm going to throw away everything out, you know, and then the 
week after is like, I love it. <laughs> so I think it's one of a struggle of uh, mouthpiece reads. I read, I use Van Doren reads as easy. And uh, this one has, has been pretty constant in my career. I find, I find, yeah. I find them. They're the getting one. more expensive as time goes by. I know, you know, is. Uh... <laughs> oh, what isn't? Uh, I, only the geeks get paid less yeah. <laughs> or stay the same. <laughs> um, Maria Schneider made a comment. She was talking about young people and learning music and being obsessed with it. And I'm sort of paraphrasing here, but she said, you have to have other interests too. You have to live life in order to write meaningful music. And which brings me to uh, your website. And you said, the things you you listed the things that were of interest to you and it was a fairly long list but i'm going to i'm just going to bring up i've never seen this combination of interests before uh, <laughs> elephants paranormal and nutella <laughs> i think they totally fit <laughs> okay. well you better explain that <laughs> no and uh, probably i mean there is also craft and sewing i'm into yes. sewing these days yeah. well uh, elephant is just uh all of his i don't know there was maybe because as a kid one of my nickname was dumbo because i have big, big ears <laughs> thank you to my brother again <laughs> and my cousin for lifting me from my ears um, <laughs> and uh, now there was something about the elephant uh, uh, just some kind of a melancholic uh, uh, characteristic, their memory. So I always associate uh, with elephants. And matter of fact, my record label um, logo as an elephant that my dad uh, drew. So nice. uh, and uh, elephant band, right? Elephant band also was a logo that also my dad uh, drew it. And uh, then what is a paranormal? I love everything about paranormal. I mean, yeah, I'm a skeptic slash believer so i go from one opposite to the other it's just like i i like to you know um, anything paranormal it can go from ghost or afterlife aliens uh, to um to just capacity of the brain i think that we have an amazing capacity of the brain and we use just three four percent so imagine what we can do if you just use one percent more you know you know, I'm asking just for the one percent, not very much, you know, daily. <laughs> but um, you know, I have I, I totally agree with Maria Schneider. I think that uh, my problem that I have way too many hobbies and I'm always uh, eager to learn my motto is like learn one thing a day. Um, that could be an information, a words or some some things. Uh, um it's like i feel i'm a sponge i have so much to learn and not enough time um i love sewing uh i pick up during uh, um uh, the uh pandemic uh, and it kind of taught me to uh you know when you sew you have to think it backwards and inside out so you just really kind of you can apply the same technique into a problem. I mean, I suffer of anxiety, and depression, and a bunch of other things. So uh, being able to approach one problem backward and inside out, uh, it can you know. And the same for I found out that when I sew, I'm thinking about musical pattern, and sometimes I'm sewing, I have to stop and write a succession of notes and pattern, and then I use it later. That that tells you the brain how wonder. You know, you wonder how they are connected the two things. So, um, unfortunately, I have too many, too many hobbies, too many curiosity. If I always ask a million questions how things works, uh, you know, on the street, uh, like uh, like a truck uh, dumping things. I just like I'm always, you know, it's just I think that uh, that's uh, when you are on the bandstand. Uh, all these little details and information might come out in a certain way as a connection, as a kind of like, I think like a little hubs going from one section to the other, right? Indeed. And it makes for a great conversation. I'll say that. I know. <laughs> I always something bizarre to say. <laughs> well, this has been a, a true pleasure. And uh, oh, thank you. I, I hope I cross paths with you and Randy sometime in the future. I definitely I would love to and yeah. play together. Yeah. And, uh, <laughs> I'll bring some Nutella. 
what what's the uh what's the very next thing that's going to happen performance wise for you well i have a couple of things in the next couple of weeks but then we're gonna we are off on a jazz cruise at the beginning of january so that's going to be exciting um and uh, that's going to be fun <laughs> Do you and then uh, your own uh, rhythm section, or do they pair you up with? Well, sometimes uh, uh, we we can go with our band. Some some other times uh, they pair us uh, with uh, different. This year, I think both me and Randy we're gonna do some of the big band stuff, and then they're gonna pair with mm -hmm. different uh, band. But mm -hmm. um, so that's gonna be exciting. So I have to polish my doublings that they're oh. rusting somewhere. <laughs> and catching dust. Okay. <laughs> well, you mentioned the vacuum cleaner before we started, so just get the vacuum out. Yes, yeah, so, you know, I suck everything out of it. <laughs> yeah, we were saying that sometimes I'd rather vacuum than practice. Unfortunately, I'm good to find the multiple tasks in whatever, yeah. but practicing, I think is a problem that a lot of musicians can relate to. Well, thank you very much. Thank you. <laughs> I'll pause us and then we'll say goodbye. Okay. <laughs>